What can the vastness of space teach us about life here on Earth? We find out as NASA astronaut Nicole Stott sits down for the CNBC conversation. Welcome to the CNBC Conversation, I'm Dan Murphy. Out of the nearly 8 billion people on planet Earth, less than 700 have ever left to explore the universe. In this edition, I speak with one of those lucky few, Nicole Stott. Two, one, booster ignition, and the final liftoff of Discovery. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Nicole Stott spent 104 days in space as both a crew member of the International Space Station and on board the now retired space shuttle. We're doing really well. They've been following instructions exceptionally well today. They lost them around. Her journey into orbit began back in 2000 when she was accepted into NASA's astronaut program. But it took nine years of training before her first launch on a trip that took her to her home for three months, the ISS. During that time, she conducted research and performed vital work to maintain the station's functions, and she undertook a near seven-hour spacewalk. And Nicole Stott moves out of the Quest airlock to begin her first spacewalk. She also found time to complete a watercolor painting inspired by what she saw. Back on Earth, her love of art has taken her in a new direction. She's the founding director of the Space for Art Foundation, a non-profit that looks to help children around the world, and she's now added author to her long list of accomplishments. I caught up with her when she attended the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature here in Dubai. Nicole Stott, welcome to CNBC. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Nice to be here. And you're here, of course, for the Emirates Festival of Literature. I assume you get a lot of requests to speak and attend events around the world. So why was it important for you to be here today? Well, I think I've established a relationship with some of the people here through the space agency and, uh, and friends. And I think that the Emirates Literature Festival, really, it's, it's a nice international um, gathering of authors. And as a new author, I felt like this would be a really nice opportunity to, to meet a lot of people from that, you know, that environment. Your book is called Back to Earth, What Life in Space Taught Me About Our Home Planet and Our Mission to Protect It. So I'm keen to know, what has life in space taught you about life back at home? I think it really... Um, in the simplest way, brings it home to me. It's like we, it's not meant to be a memoir, although there are anecdotal stories in there, of course, and certainly about my spaceflight experience, but more really about how we've just so peacefully, successfully established this mechanical life support system in space, right? With this international community of 15 different countries coming together for over 20 years now in this place in space with this mission ultimately all about improving life on Earth with the work we're doing there. And the ways we do that, that's what I want to come through in the book, is the ways that we do that as this community to um, be this just really wonderful example for how we should be living like crewmates down here on Spaceship Earth. What would you say was the most important lesson that you learned while you were up there? Well, I would say it comes down to this idea of us behaving like crewmates and not passengers. And it seems a little subtle, but I think it's pretty powerful to consider the difference between what is it like to be a crewmate on a spaceship versus being a passenger on a spaceship. And we can very easily think of Earth as our planet, which is our life support system, as our spaceship. And uh, we go and we live on the International Space Station, right? This machine we've built in space to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally. And every day there as crew, we have to know how much CO2 is in our atmosphere. We have to be aware of how much clean drinking water we have and the integrity of our thin metal hull and yes, the health and well-being of all our crewmates. I think that underlies it all. And that's what you and I should be doing with respect to each other and all other life we share this planet with. Indeed, and I also get the sense that from your perspective, at least going to space probably gives you a different perspective about how we tackle these issues back at home. Let's talk a little bit more about your time in space because you have had an incredible career as an astronaut, two space flights. The first one lasted 91 days, as I understand it. You also performed a spacewalk that lasted six and a half hours. 
So what's your most favorite memory from that experience? And can you actually pinpoint it down? No, I mean, all of it, really. I mean, you, each of those things you mentioned, it's like, oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, the whole thing kind of wraps up, even both flights all together kind of wrap up into this memory, this really wonderful memory. And, you know, there's certainly the, the unique things about that environment, you know, getting to float, you know, pushing gently on your chair and moving in three dimensions and just this liberating feeling of flying from one end of the space station to the other. And, uh, you know, the work that we're doing there as this international community, which, um, I mean, I think people would be in awe of the fact that there's hundreds of experiments going on every day in pretty much air, every area of science you can imagine. Again, all of it with this overarching goal of improving life on Earth. And then, you know, then find yourself with your crew in front of the window looking out, you know, back towards Earth. And that is just this reality check of, oh my gosh, we live on a planet. You know, that kind of thing that we learn in kindergarten and somehow don't keep active in our brains every day. And holy moly, we're all Earthlings. And wow, the only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere. And that, I think, then drives you to this idea of, wow, I really do need to behave like a crewmate when I'm down on that place too, not just on this mechanical life support system. Extraordinary. And it's a very simple question, but a very human question as well. Did you ever get scared or nervous <laughs> while you were up there? I don't think, I, scared or afraid, those, I don't remember those feelings. But I mean, I remember from, you know, sitting on the launch pad all the way through, you know, landing, just this awareness, this anxiousness of, oh my gosh, what's it gonna feel like? I've trained so long for this. Certainly a respect um, for, you know, strapping onto a rocket that's then gonna have seven million pounds of exploding, you know, rocket thrust underneath you. You appreciate the significance of that. But if I think about like fear in any way, it wasn't about me. It was about my seven-year-old son and my husband watching me do this, my mom and my sisters watching me doing it, and knowing just how much more difficult it is to be a person watching somebody you love launch into space than it is to be the person strapping into the rocket. What was that experience like for you as a mother? There were kind of mixed feelings, I think. You know, I really felt like Flying in space was not about the adventure of flying in space. Certainly, I highly recommend that. I mean, it is a, I mean, it's a double Z ride. You know, Disney World used to have the e-ticket rides, and I mean, it's like whatever letter in the alphabet you have, multiply that by ten times. But um, and the, you know, being in space. But I think it was for me. If I didn't believe in the mission of what we were doing, I couldn't have strapped into the rocket to go do that. And I tried very hard, my husband and I did, to make sure that our son was involved with the training that I was doing, you know, bringing him out to that, traveling to different countries with me to see um, the work and meet the people that I was gonna be with and their families and to have him feel as much like the crew as, as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I, I will tell you that my five crewmates who were dads were probably feeling a lot of the same things that I would as a mother. How important is it for you to share the experience that you've had with the public? And to an extension of that, are you proud of what you've achieved in space? Uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm proud of it. But I'm proud of how, I think even more, the way we've shown that you can come together as an international community and do really significant, you know, life-changing, positive things for, you know, the world around us, for the future that we all want. Uh, yeah, so I'm proud of it. I mean, you're excited to share it because it was something that you really enjoyed and you knew the work was good, but I think there's, you, you're compelled to do it. And we all, I think, find our way kind of uniquely to, to make that happen. And writing a book is something that a lot of us do. Working in different uh, space industries becomes a part of something. And then I've, I've chosen art as a way to do that as well. And not just through my own artwork, but by establishing this foundation called Space for Art, where we're working with kids all over the world and uh, in hospitals and refugee centers and orphanages and bringing them together in a way that we like to say is uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art, which very purposely we're trying to get them to think about, you know, beyond the situation that we're in, that they're in, which we hope is the worst thing they're ever having to deal with their entire lives, and that they're able to lift out of that through this idea of what's happening in space and how that's improving life on Earth and for them to consider their futures that way. And 
that they are crewmates. And they get it. Kids get it. It's Indeed. so cool. Indeed. Yeah. How, how do you see that foundation growing and expanding into the future? What's your plans there? Well, we've always had kind of three tenants going along with it as, as we've been developing. And, and when I say we, it's like four. There's four, four of us that are these, you know, volunteering, coming together. And then we're very thankful to have ILC Dover, which is the company that made my spacesuit that I did my spacewalk with. And the guys that walked on the moon, you know, were wearing their suits. And they have volunteered with us since the very beginning to quilt the children's artwork together into these really beautiful art spacesuits, some of which have had the opportunity to fly in space. And we always want to do the work with the kids in, you know, in these different places around the world. But we want also to be able to facilitate through scholarships, grants to other young artists um, who want to apply their, their talents to art therapy and um, wellness. And then we also know that there's a really cool aspect of this whole art and healing thing that is going to apply to astronauts traveling further away from Earth. And, you know, for example, you get in a spaceship to go to Mars, it's gonna take you, I don't know, seven months to get there in a relatively small place. And at some point in time, you're gonna cross a place in space where Earth doesn't look like Earth out the window anymore. And you're going to need, just like those kids in the hospitals or the, the refugee centers, you're gonna need something that psychologically allows you to you know, transcend that, that place. And, um, and I'm kind of hoping it's a Star Trek holodeck, but you know, these kinds of art or music or you know, human in this human space-like kind of things are, are what we're gonna need to do there as well. And I think we can support that, the development of those kinds of activities. One of the other really fascinating things about you is that you spend a lot of time up high, but you've also spent a lot of time down low. You've been working with the Aquarius Underwater Lab Laboratory, I believe it's mm -hmm. called. For people who don't know what that is, just explain your work with the lab and what it is exactly you were doing so far underwater. Yeah, well, NASA, as part of our astronaut training, I'd say in every bit of training we do, whether you're in a classroom studying how the electrical system works or you're learning how to do a spacewalk, Everything about it is, is really and truly about how do you work as a crew? How do you discover your own strengths and weaknesses and how to deal with those and those of your crewmates? And so you can really come together as a, a, a successful team. And one of the places, absolutely the best place that we go to do that is 60 feet underwater off the coast of Key Largo, Florida, in this school bus sized habitat that sits on the ocean floor and had the opportunity to live there with a crew of six total for 18 days. Mm -hmm. The closest thing you could get to living and working in space. And that's because you are really and truly in an extreme environment. Once you're down there for 60 minutes, you know, your body's so saturated with nitrogen, you can't just swim safely to the surface, so you have to go through a special process to, you know, reacclimatize, get that nitrogen out of your body to be able to go to the surface. So anything that might go wrong in that 18 days, you have to, as a crew, figure out how to deal with it at 60 feet underwater. And that's the same thing in space. I mean, you can't just hop in your spaceship anytime you want to to come home. You have to deal with it there as a crew. And oh my gosh. And then it's almost like to have Earth wrapping around you. And we kind of joke that, oh, you get to go live in inner space to learn how to live and work in outer space. And you get, again, this whole new perspective on Earth as our home, as this planet. You've got these ginormous grouper looking in the window at you saying, oh, you know, who's in the aquarium today? You know, it's kind of this flip of, of who's meant to be in that place and, and how we as humans can adapt to that and learn more about ourselves and how to be successful. So what, what did you learn after 18 days underwater? I'll tell you, one of the things I learned was, man, if I never go to space, this was awesome. This was, I, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it still, and I highly recommend it as well, just as I do space. But oh my gosh, that, that there's so much going on around us all the time. It, it, there's awe and wonder everywhere. And you do not have to go fly on a spaceship and look out the window back at Earth to discover these things like we live on a planet. You know, we need to be crewmates, not passengers. That can come from, you know, just looking around us, you know, here with our feet, you know, on the ground or underwater diving too. Mm, not your average scuba yeah. dive, I guess you could say. Yeah, but I highly recommend the scuba diving too, just to get that. Indeed, that just to fun. have the experience. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, we often hear about a lack of women in science, but also a lack of women in space, just generally. 
What can organizations like NASA do to improve female participation in this industry? And does it have to go beyond NASA as well when you look to perhaps the commercial operations that we're seeing in space now as well? What can they do to ensure that female participation is improving and increasing in this important sector? Yeah, I, actually, I'd like to you know give thumbs up to NASA. Actually, I think that there's NASA has been progressive all along. If you look just kind of at the demographic that's happened all along, I don't know if it was like forcefully done at some point, you know, deliberately that way, but. Even in the NASA astronaut office now, with a total of, I think, about 40 active astronauts, almost 40% are female. And that's huge when you look at a comparison to, say, most university engineering programs that struggle to get 20% female enrollment. So I think the real answer to your question is, what do, what do NASA and other organizations and these other spaceflight companies need to be doing with kids in middle school, you know, encouraging that pool of women to um, want to be participating in activities like that and really kind of grasping their attention at that age. Um, and, and I think NASA has a lot of programs that do it. I know a lot of the space companies are working um, with that as well, with the women and, and the men in their, in their companies to, um, to increase this diversity in, in those workplaces. And, and it is improving. Um, I, I can use an example with NASA in particular. If you think about this, you know, 2019 and um, till now are like the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. And you go back 50 years ago and look in mission control in Houston. There were no women in the, the main control center. There was one woman, Poppy Northcutt, in the back, back room, you know, cranking away you know, all the, the equations and the work to get, you know, to get these guys safely to the moon and back. Launch Control Center in Florida, there was one woman there, Joanne Morgan. And now, both of those places are run by really incredible women. And when you look at the center itself, the people sitting at all the, you know, the fancy little computer stations there, you're not saying, oh, where's Joanne? You know, where's Poppy? It's because it's just this mix of humanity. And I think it's a really wonderful representation for how we should be doing that across the board everywhere. And I wish I knew what the secret sauce was to how that was happening there, but um, we need to get them younger. Mm. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a role model? I, I guess so. I mean, I feel like it's a responsibility for me to be present, to, and in particular for young women to show them, you know, just to be this example, right? And um, to let them know that, you know, with or without the blue jacket on, right? And there are things that are possible that seem impossible. And I mean, I still pinch myself that, you know, I can put this on, legitimately wear it, and have it represent the experiences that I've had. And hopefully, when young girls see that, they can kind of put themselves in that place. And I think girls, for whatever reason, need to see it. And so, very thankful that you know, that my colleagues feel that way too. I wanted to ask you about the future of space and the situation as it stands today. Russia and the United States have really led the way when it comes to space travel and exploration. Space has been a fantastic arena for international cooperation, but it's also increasingly becoming an arena where we see international competition. Do you welcome that competition and how do you see the future actually playing out from an international perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, space has been just this beautiful example of international cooperation. Even you go back to the, you know, when you say like Russia and the U.S., go back to Apollo Soyuz, where you had the Soviet spacecraft docking with this American spacecraft. The crew members are shaking hands and, you know, living for a little while in space together. They were best friends for the rest of their lives. I mean, that was a pivotal moment in terms of how do we come together as an international community, not just in space, but here on Earth. And it's continued with the International Space Station. All of those countries that are participating in one way or another are still competing as well. And I think it's healthy competition though, when you look at, at those countries, they're all wanting to continue to develop their tech, to bring that to life. And yet I think we're always gonna be coming together to really make it happen in space. Um, there's a lot of other countries you know, now that are also trying to develop their activities. Um, I actually look at that competition as a way for us to reinvigorate ourselves, to really kind of lift ourselves up even more and understand it from both the good and bad sides of what could happen from you know, some of these other countries wanting to gain 
access to different places in space and how we need to be positively engaging to make it a good scene up there. And, and then of course you have the commercial activities going on and I'm like, yes, let's, let's get that going. I know there's a lot of argument about the billionaires doing their thing in space and I'm like, please, you know, those are the baby steps that we need to take to make it more accessible to, you know, to anyone who wants to have that access. Why do you welcome that? Because I guess the criticism has been that that is just a, a pure personal pursuit. They're not doing it for the betterment of society or humanity. They're doing it for themselves. What do you say to that? Well, go talk to them is what I'd say. And I, I, you know, maybe they need better comm people or something, but every single one of those people has a really wonderful motivation behind it. Even if it's business driven, there's, you know, you look at Bezos. Suborbital flights are not that man's goal in, um, for space flight. You know, he ultimately wants to lift the, the nasty industrial stuff off the planet into the relatively benign environment of space and do that in a way that's sustainable so that Earth does become this, you know, this park-like paradise that we all want it to be in the future, right? And those, those are pretty wonderful motivations. Um, same thing with Musk, you know, yeah, he wants to get to Mars. He want, I, I think he wants to go to Mars himself, you know, and he speaks about a multi-planetary species, you know, saving ourselves that way. Um, again, lifting some of what's going on on Earth off of it to improve life here. Um, those, those are pretty positive motivation. I just don't think that is what's communicated um, necessarily. What happens next when it comes to the future of space exploration and how soon before we get to Mars? You know, I don't know the answer about Mars. I hope, I hope in my lifetime. Um, I think the next step really is the moon. Um, if you look at NASA, you know, we're kind of transitioning from this idea of the Apollo era, the space station era, to this um, era of Artemis, where, you know, the diversity thing you mentioned is like, that's all part of that as well, the accessibility of space and getting, you know, people back on the moon, around the moon, establishing a permanent presence there that will allow us to get to Mars, I think, in a more efficient way, and also will be leveraging the resources of the moon for the benefit of life here on Earth. And through the Artemis program, we're looking at our, you know, first woman, first wo or person of color stepping foot on the moon, and I think that's a pretty exciting thing as well. Really exciting. Nicole yeah. Stott, it's great to speak with you today. Thanks you for too. joining us. Thank you. That's all we have time for on this edition of the CNBC Conversation. For more, head to our website. I'm Dan Murphy in Dubai. Thanks for watching.